So thank you for taking the time out of your day to chat with us. We're really excited. Um, we have a couple questions lined up, um, but feel free to ask us any questions uh, anytime. Yeah, cool. Okay. Sorry, before you guys get started, I'm sorry. Like, I just want to make sure, you know, it goes um, conversation wise. I don't want it to be like, you know, so um, like, why did you guys decide to? I know uh, Brooklyn, you founded a program, right? Um, Shima. So do you mind just talking about, I guess, yeah, like why? Like what made you start up fund the program? Because um, I was taking Dr. Trussell's grad school, I mean, grad course last year. And then she introduced the idea and this, she's like, oh, we're in the process of starting this up. What do you guys think? And it was me and Amanda. Um, I'm not sure if she told you the story, but um, she was just, I don't know, talking about, oh, hey, like, you know, there are a few uh, for undergrad students that felt like, you know, they're isolated from the program just because how predominantly, you know, male oriented the program is. So I'm just curious to know, I guess, firsthand, like why, like what, what made you start it up and your, the story behind it, basically. Yeah, so just first, I actually am not the founder of the oh. of the of Shima. I'm actually just I'm the event coordinator. So the two founders are Michaela and Hannah. Okay. Um, so we were just really thankful to meet them and be a part of Shima. But um, yeah. basically, I can still explain it, though. So we know, like, as you mentioned, our program is very male dominated, even in the sport world in general. Mm -hmm. um, so within the students and the faculty, so our um, club, Sport Helps Everyone Make Allies, basically is working to stand at the forefront of this FEMA program so that all students feel welcomed and included. Um, and then kind of just to put it in a, in a lump sum so it don't bombard you with so much information, but our club is, is using um, the students and faculty of Brock as our foundation um, okay. to build a platform that brings awareness to unconscious bias, the exclusionary environment in sport, specifically with women and socially diverse groups. Yep. And then also um, the social injustice happening around the world. So we um, we would like to be a part of this change and expand from Brock, but we obviously needed to start somewhere. So that's why we started with the Brock University and the students here as well. Yeah. A lot of it is just um, like awareness and education and just mm -hmm. trying to bring to light that um, there are discrepancies uh, within uh, what's what the sport management program is uh, putting out there um, because mm -hmm. as we all know it's a lot of um, you know male focused that kind of thing yeah. as yeah. is most of the sport industry right now too so we want to make sure um, we educate on those discrepancies there and just bring awareness to it overall. Cool and then um, it, I'm assuming like is this is your second year right the program's second year uh, or is like it hasn't come to one year yet? This is actually our first year. Yeah, our first okay. anniversary was uh, maybe like a week ago. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is our first, our inaugural year. Cool, okay. Yeah, yeah I guess I can't answer my next follow-up question uh, because from my year, I remember there was literally, sorry, I know we didn't start the interview, but we'll get there. Oh, no, uh, no, no. no, no. Okay. Uh, because I remember uh, my year in, uh, in first year, I think we had like the highest BMA students come into the program there was about eight black students, like, and we're all friends, you know what I mean? So like, uh, I see the beauty in this. So I just, like, I understand, you know, the, the program's foundation is the women and the program felt isolated. That's where the program is in place now. Like, that's beautiful. And like, I, I, I'm basically, I'm saying I try to, I guess, diversify as much as possible by trying to, even like um, on the, I, I, I don't know where I saw it, but, uh, I think the vice president is a male, so like that, that just like someone on the executive team. There's a male that's on it, right? So I'm like, that's be that's amazing because the allyship. That's how you know we're we're focusing on women, but it's important to include the male aspect. So yeah, sorry, I just wanted to put out there and just try to like literally diversify as much as possible. Although the program isn't as diverse, but like maybe this program is like the next step into diversifying the. You know, the SPMO program as a whole. So yeah, anyways, that's that's just my over, overall <laughs> thoughts. And I just had a few questions. So thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to get into the interview. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, feel free to ask any questions you have. Um, you know, this is an interview, but it's also just a discussion um, where we can kind of just talk about these things. So thank you for that. Cool. Um, so I'll hop into the first question. So yeah. 
First, we want to say congratulations on your recent one year anniversary of the Muslim Women's Summer Basketball League. So such an amazing achievement. And as women ourselves who love to watch and play sports, we know how important something like this really is. So we would love to know what really inspired you to create this league and what the impact has been so far. Mm, uh, wonderful question. Um, why? Why did Muspel start? Um, I would say, um, I, I, sorry, the question, okay, normally, I'm sorry, okay, you might have to re-ask the question, but I would normally go from backwards to, like, the question that I originally get asked at the beginning is at the end now, I'm just like, I don't know how to go forward or backwards, it's so <laughs> weird, but um, in short, sorry, just, if you want to ask the question again, but I may be answering your question that you'll be asking later on, so if you want to dismiss it, by all means. <laughs> I'm Anyways, so, I'm getting okay, back to okay. the Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so kind of what um, was the big inspiration for you to come up with this league? And yeah. also, if you could touch on what you've seen the impact from that um, so far. Yes, for sure. Um, so the reason why I decided to start up the league uh, was because I didn't see other individuals that looked like me when I was playing basketball. Um, and I, I fell in love with basketball in high school. And from there, I felt like I had a responsibility to contribute to this, the Muslim women's community, Muslim women's sport community, because um, I felt like there weren't any out there. And I was questioning as to why we're missing from this field, because um, at that time, I didn't realize I was actually leading some sort of change because I was just playing basketball because I love the sport. Um, but as I got as I got older, uh, as I, you know, I guess got interested in uh, the whole sport movement and just studying sport management and understanding how the whole, um, you know, organizations run because of, you know, the sport management courses we took, uh, I took through our undergrad. And I felt like I, I guess I had the knowledge to actually start up something that could have a big impact, not just like as a hobby, but like more so on a serious, you know, level. Um, so I, I feel like after graduating from the sport management program, I feel like I could definitely had the confidence to like start up something on my own that made sense and um, allow my voice to be heard throughout it, not just like more than basketball, you know. So um, with the basketball league, uh, the hope was to change narratives about Muslim women, um, change narratives about uh, women like playing sports and, you know, we're capable, we could play ball or we could play any sports and also Islam, because um, the religion of Islam, every social media or every media outlet has always uh, portrayed it to be this negative religion and this uh, terrorist organization. Like, anyways, my that's a hope to basically change the narratives with um, with the basketball league. And I, I feel like, in short, just getting my uh, bachelor's degree kind of gave me that confidence that I could definitely do it. And in terms of impact. Um, uh, the fact that media outlet has reached out to the insider, like rather than an outsider population that didn't know what Muslims are about, what Muslim females have to, you know, consider when, when partaking in sports, um, is is I feel like that definitely has been an impact because um, being recognized by Nike, being recognized by the Toronto Star, being recognized by CBC Radio, and basically them gaining information from an insider, I feel like. Um, it is an impact or it was a voice or a narrative that we we've been hoping for for so long um, we're just we're just thankful and it's just the beginning <laughs> absolutely yeah I, it's absolutely just the beginning I am so excited to see what um, can stem from this mm -hmm. and I love to hear that this was kind of started out of your passion for the sport um, and you took that confidence that you got from taking all these classes in your undergraduate degree so that's really amazing to hear yeah definitely I love I love that you said um it's more than basketball it's true it's more than a game right um so much can come from the sport not just the physical activity part of it right so I love that you mentioned that and change doesn't happen overnight but it looks like you know you're doing so much and your voice is being heard and I love to see that so we are here right behind you supporting and we can't wait to see what else comes forward hey thank you so much um yeah, no problem. So speaking of some works that we're doing right now, we're curious to know what you have in the works at this moment or what your plans for the near future include. Mm, um, definitely the goal is to finish my master's. <laughs> <laughs> Balancing everything has been very interesting. Um, people forget that I'm doing my master's. Um, that's actually the priority. Um, so it's there's I have a lot of things, in, you know, in, like in the making for the league, but 
I feel like time is very uh, restricted. So I, I can't do much, but in the long run, the plan is to um, make the league known in Toronto and then um, Canada and then North America. Uh, once the name and the brand of the, the brand of the league is there, uh, go back to the motherland. I was born in Ethiopia and um, I want to show the girls down there what basketball did for me and um, just teach them the life skills that basketball has taught me as an individual when I first came to Canada. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of things that I really want to do with the league, but I just need to finish my master's first. So that's, that's... <laughs> Definitely. Those are some great aspirations. I mean, I know you'll make it and that's going to be so wonderful when you get to go back and talk to fellow girls because then they can look up to someone that mm -hmm. resembles them and they know they can do it and instill confidence in them as well. So that sounds so beautiful and I'm looking forward to that. But yes, education is a priority too. Yeah. So <laughs> congratulations though, getting through your master's, that's still a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And I know you'll get there soon. So like props to you. I mean, it's a lot to balance everything you're, you're reaching for, school, social life, sleep, everything, right? So, I mean, it's a lot to balance and I mean, from the outside perspective, it looks like you're handling it all very well. So that's great. No, I should tell after. Thank you. No problem. Absolutely. I love to hear that, you know, you're going to start off local in Toronto and then hopefully get that to Canada and North America. And that's so, um, it's so heartfelt to hear um, that you want to bring it back to your roots and, uh, you know, show the girls where you came from and uh, kind of help them out there. So I that's it's beautiful to hear. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, so our next question. So our club sport helps everyone make allies or Shima for short um, values and recognizes the importance of diversity and inclusion overall and within the sport world specifically. Um, this past year, we've seen so many diversity and inclusion positions being added to organizations, which is really great to see, such as all those uh, women working um, this the past Super Bowl that just happened, for example. Um, so as an advocate for change yourself, what advice do you have for us and other current sport, sport management students heading into the sport industry to help ensure um, that we're implementing diversity and inclusion um, so we can walk along, alongside you and many more to be part of this necessary change? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I feel like sometimes is the is as is as little as questioning yourself how can you make your organization more inclusive or how, more diverse so um sometimes it's literally that reflection that's needed and um in the long run i guess for future um practi practici practitioners i can't even say the word uh, <laughs> future i guess for management um uh, leaders uh, i would say when you're implementing um a sport policy or when you're implementing um, anything relating to your organization, I feel like questioning yourself, who am I excluding from by stating, by making the statement into, you know, this form or this policies I'm, write, I'm writing, um, and even like marketing, like who, when you're, because the, the purpose of marketing is to try to attract more people into your organization, right? So when you're only representing one group on, on your posters, what is that saying about your organization? Um, who are you trying to include? You know, what culture are you trying to create? So um, it's a matter of just like considering those little things because that's what it's, you know, I, a young individual that's going to see that poster is going to like, oh, okay, I'm not there. So that means I don't belong there. So it's, it's not, I don't know, it's not actually as hard as people make it, you know, seem, but it, it I, don't, it's, I feel like you just have to, you know, reflect and see, like if I was in, you know, maybe, a person of color, how can I feel excluded by looking at this poster? You know, just those little things. So I would just recommend uh, for future leaders to think critically about everything that they are putting out to the world, because that is what's going to have, a, I guess, an impact on the next generation of leaders or the next generation of um, individuals that would want to take part in the organization. So yeah, in short, just be very critical about what you're putting out to the world as an organization. Absolutely. Um, I think that's really well said. I think that one extra step of just taking a step back and looking at what you're putting out there, what that message is, um, and what other people will receive of that message. Um, because a lot of times people just don't even think about it. They think, you know what, this is, 
you know, this is going to be great for marketing, great for our campaign, perfect, awesome. But just taking that extra step back, as you're saying, to just reflect on yourself and be critical, like not afraid to be critical um, and ask those questions. Um, so that's definitely um, great advice. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I remember an interview we had this past um, semester, we talked about checking yourself and not in a rude way, but like Madeline was saying, take a step back and understand what decisions are you making? How are you responding? Where are your perspectives coming from? Is it in a tunnel vision or are you open to everything, right? And mm -hmm. mistakes happen, but what, are, what do you do with those mistakes, right? So, and like you said, it's really not hard to be inclusive and diverse. It's really not. Um, and it kind of just shows um, your values um, on, on how you respond and how do you how you react, right? And marketing strategies, as we both we're talking about who are our targets, one demographic, multiple demographics, right? So it's it's really, truly important to include. And I mean, we've had many conversations about how, how diversity enhances organizations as a whole. So I mean, there's benefits on all levels, right? So definitely agree with that and love the advice that you've put out there for sure. Um, so for our next question, could you tell us a little bit about the Nike Made to Play Hijab playbook that you recently got to help develop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so along with Nike and um, uh, Hijabi Ballers, uh, we were able to put together a playbook. Um, it's basically a coach's guide. So uh, Nike finally made it like an actual playbook. It's like a document. It's, it's, it's very like fun though. It's very visualized. Um, it's fun to even read through if you know if you guys have time, feel free to um, scan through it and see you know what you could uh, take away from. But it's it, it basically the playbook explains um, how to uh, be I guess support Muslim female athletes uh, if you actually end up coaching them or. Um, or if you're an organization leader, how to actually be more supportive of these Muslim female athletes that want to take part in sport. But so it's meant to be for, I guess, those that don't have, like are very, they want to be supported, but don't have enough knowledge and, and are concerned. They don't want to cross over, you know, the boundaries. So by looking at it, you'll have a basic understanding of how to actually support such as um you know like just because a must uh, you know the the individual that's you know wants to take part in sport this, just because they're not wearing the hijab that doesn't mean they're muslim you know so just like it goes over you know the little basics so um yeah to just give you a better understanding and the opportunity and with nike it, it was great um, I felt like, you know, it just took my advocacy to the next level because that booklet is being um, distributed to like literally so many, I guess, uh, partners of Nike, uh, like uh, sport par uh, global partners and local partners. And with that, they're also donating hijab. So that that came hand in hand. And yeah, so it's it's I don't know. I thought the, the opportunity was wonderful. And the fact that we were on the consultant on the on the project was uh, was amazing. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Oh, no. Sure, I felt like yeah. I think, but um, <laughs> oh no, definitely not. No, that was amazing. I'm so excited for you, and I'm so that's such a great accomplishment that you got to do that. And I just love that it's it's a great read, and it's if you're not knowledgeable on the topic, then it's all there for you, right? And I think that's the key too with allyship is it's important to be educated before you take action. So. It's okay to not know everything, but it's the same with mistakes. How do you react to it? What do you change? So if you don't know something before you speak, educating ourselves is the first step we need to do in order to take action and unite as one. So I don't know about anybody else, but I have free time this weekend. So I am definitely going to take a look at that for sure. So thank you so much for explaining that. Yeah, no worries. I was actually about to say the same thing. I don't you know, I don't know anything really about this topic mm. and about um, Muslim women playing sports and what, um, you know, accommodations or anything have to be made. So I absolutely do want to read upon this and educate myself because um, I think it's so knowledgeable in the future. You never know. I might have to, you know, this is information that would definitely help me. And I always think it's better to be prepared then when something comes up and you have to scramble and panic and look for something. And uh, so I'm definitely going to take a look at that. And I think it's so important. I'm really happy to hear that um, Nike got the opinions of Muslim women such as yourself, um, rather than kind of figuring it all out on their own. Um, you have these personal experiences and obviously know 
what's best, what works. Um, so I'm really happy to hear that um, they've made this and you you were able to collaborate with them on this. So that's really exciting. Hey, thank you so much. It was it was the opportunity was um it was it was it was at the beginning of COVID. We're all at home. We're like, how can we still tackle this problem and educate you know the rest of the world? So um yeah. So your your thoughts, I appreciate that for real. Mm -mm. Yeah, great. Um, so our next question, kind of you touched upon this a little bit before. So we understand you're pursuing your master's degree right now. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you manage your school life um, while being active in all the things you do right now in sport and advocacy? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, the journey is, is very interesting um, for sure. And I don't think COVID made this made it any easier too because you have to do everything from home now um but ooh, i feel like i'm still low-key trying to figure out how to manage everything there are days i just don't want to do anything sometimes weeks i just don't want to do anything but you have to do some stuff because that deadline hits you and you don't want to miss those things um yeah so i think one thing has always been like i got in the routine of getting up very early um so i get up i like there are days like you know i just sleep it sleep in but I get up uh, four, like four, th okay, five o'clock. I try to get up and actually get to work so I could tackle the hard task of the day, which is my thesis. So this is normally, um, you know, it's hard to get in the zone. So that time from like five to like nine, like if I actually could focus for that long, um, I'm working on my thesis. Uh, but, and then throughout the day, other things hit me. I feel like I've already accomplished the hardest thing of the day because, you know, the thesis off the list. Um, yeah, it's, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's, I'm still literally learning how to manage everything, but yeah, that's, that's just, that's life. We have to figure it out as you go, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I cannot imagine waking up that early every day. So props to you for that. Um, for me, this past week, I've been like trying to get up at like 8 or 8.30 and that's early to me. Mm -hmm. And same thing, I try to get those big heavy tasks out of the way. Um, so I can't imagine all that you're juggling on your plate right now and you seem to be doing a great job with it all. So, um, so keep it up. You're doing amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I am not going to lie. I don't remember the last time I got up at 5 a.m. So <laughs> that's awesome. Like even last night I couldn't sleep and I was up around that time. And in my head, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should just get up. Did I? No. no. So <laughs> it, it, it props to you. Seriously, what Madeline was saying, like, that's awesome. And you know what? I just saw a post the other day and it was, it was like, not five, it was seven, but getting up at seven and working straight through to one, like, it's crazy how much you can get done in that part of the day. And it's true. Just like, the late Kobe Bryant getting up 3.30 a.m. like ahead of ahead of the game, always working, always striving for greatness. So it's true. And I mean, and that's not to put down anyone who doesn't wake up at 5 a.m. because everyone has their own life. Everyone has their own time clock and responsibilities. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, props to you going after it. Like there are some days you, like you said, you don't want to. And those days you kind of have to push yourself a little bit yeah. um, to get at least something done. Right. So yeah. I mean, that's awesome. Good, good for you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. It, it was hard. Literally, it was so hard to get into it. And then I felt like I had to meet deadlines. I'm like, I can't. And then throughout the day, literally, there's you have to respond to emails. You have to yep. do these good things that just like your brain can't fully focus. And for certain things, you literally need your entire brain. You know, just like a tiny mm -hmm. bit that was the whole full brain, right? So, yeah, I feel like it's it, you just have to figure out what works best for you and then be, try to be mm -hmm. consistent with it and you'll see results and then you'll be motivated to continue. Exactly. Those, those little tedious tasks sometimes gets to us, but yeah. it's like you said, it's worth it in the end. Hard work will pay off. So, and I mean, you're a test to that perfectly. So, I mean, things are, things are going really well. So we're happy to be in support and watch you shine. So sweet. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So I know we've talked a lot about your accomplishments and the great work coming ahead, but I would love to hear about your start. So, um, I read that you really looked into advocacy in, I think, about 2015, if I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so when did you start playing um, basketball, and, like, why do you love it, and just kind of how that all started? Mm. Okay, good. That Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> how did it start? I arrived in Canada when I was around the age of 10, and I didn't speak English whatsoever. 
um, in my elementary school, um, my favorite class to be in was physical education uh, because I was never, I guess, introduced to sports before. And I felt like I was learning a new, I guess, a new skill. And the fact that the gym teacher was explaining every little skills to everybody on the same level. And I didn't feel like I was behind whatsoever because everyone was starting from the same level or those that were, I think that's, I don't know, sorry. That's just like something about sport. It doesn't matter how many times the coach like explained it. You have to, you have to continue to practice and get better, right? But obviously for me, I didn't see it as, you know, I was behind because the teacher was explaining and everyone was following the instructions. And whether we have to dribble, you have to try to challenge yourself by dribbling faster or slower, you know, or basically, yeah, you get the point. And yeah, so I felt like um, I wasn't behind whatsoever. And I got introduced to this, so many other sports I never knew existed. And um, that's, I guess, my discovery, my myself being introduced to sport, like in physical education. And then um, another thing was I didn't speak English whatsoever. So um, I think that was another reason why physical education became like my favorite class, because I didn't have to know the language to, to see what the teacher was doing or to understand what she was trying to say, because I could just follow her or follow the other kids. And yeah, so when I moved on to high school, my one of my coaches um, forced, was forcing all the girls that he saw in the hallway to come and try out. I feel like you guys can relate. <laughs> <laughs> he was forcing all the girls to know you guys have to come and try out. And then later on, he just we learned that um, he was forcing all the girls to try out because if we didn't try out, the teams won't happen because that's the challenge that you know high school go high school coaches go through because not enough girls would be, would try out to make the team. And I'm just like, whatever, okay, I'll try out. Like this, this coach wants me to try out, why not? Uh, so I was excited. And then obviously I wasn't good because I just learned the sport. And um, I think what was unique about him was he was just encouraging all the girls to like, you know, do this. It was just like, he, he told us to just have fun, you know, do our thing. And then when he's coaching, would coach you guys play a game or leave. I don't know, he just did her own thing, his own thing. But he, I think, I feel like that was a motivation. And it just felt like, okay, this is basketball, like, we could have fun, and then I ended up trying out for all the sports that he coached, because I, like, I genuinely liked him as a coach, and, yeah, I guess my love for basketball, I get, like, from the other sports that I played, like, I fell in love, with literally, basketball, and um, throughout high school, I wanted to try out for, you know, uh, sports, I guess, basketball outside of my school team, like, rep teams and whatnot, and then, yeah, I don't know, there's some other things that came with it that, you know, I wasn't able to like um, play for rep teams because my mom wasn't truly supportive of me playing sport at the beginning because it wasn't the norm within the Muslim culture or like, you know, the traditional, um, she, we're literally immigrants. So she, she didn't want me to focus on sport because she came, she brought us here for us to have a better life and she didn't see the value in sport. So I didn't want to ask her for money to try for like, you know, outside of my, uh, like I started my high school for high school I think we had to pay like only like ten dollars and that was for like the uniform so and cover so many things but to try for rep team and I didn't even know it costed that much money so I'm like no I'm not gonna do it like I'll just I'll just you know whatever it's not that serious I'll just do it for fun and a community center it was literally outside of my my neighborhood and uh, the one of my friends like yeah Fifi come try out like come and play ball here with us that like don't worry you don't have to pay that much it's like five dollars for the whole year I'm just like wait what five dollars I have five dollars so I got so excited and then I was happy that I didn't have to ask my mom for money to actually pay for this membership and then from there yeah like I just literally trained because every Monday is from like six to nine they would have basketball training so I went every like literally for like three four years I was training with the guys like was like a co-ed training uh, session. So I would train with them and I was in there showing them that like, don't treat me any less because I'm a woman. You know, I was always advocating for that because there are times that like, they wouldn't wanna like, def I'm like, no, when I'm defending, I'll make sure I'm defending them. Like I would show them like, if you need to hit me, hit me. And then don't, don't, don't try to say, I'm going hard on her because she's a girl. Like I'm trying to literally like, nah, that's not how it works. If I'm on the court, I want to be treated the same. So that's how it was. Um, and then, yeah, like I would say that's how like the basketball journey began. And when I got into uh, sport management, I was debating between kinesiology. I feel like this is literally 
every every SNEMA student's challenge. Should I do kin or sport management? And yeah, when I got accepted to SPIMA, I guess, no, I knew that science wasn't for me. So I'm like, nope, I cannot do kin because science is not for me. So when I got into SPIMA, I'm just like, yep, I guess this is what it is. Like, um, maybe not, I don't want to do, you know, not from the play aspect, but um, I definitely want to do more, something more with the sport world. Um, and in terms of advocacy, to answer that simple question, um, uh, when I entered uni in SPIMA in 2015, um, I was following Bilkis Abdul Qadir's story, and she wanted to play basketball at the international level, but there, FIBA had um, a rule in place that said a headgear relating to headgear. So um, any um, any individual that was wearing a, um, a headgear that was like, you know those thin headbands, like those thin, thin, that like basically like to cover, you know, to push your hair so it doesn't cover. Yeah, you guys know what I mean. And so anyone that was wearing um, something that was thicker than that wasn't allowed. So what that meant was a Muslim female athlete with the hijab wouldn't be able to participate at that at that level because they had this policy in place. And she she wanted to play. At, she was good. She was literally like she was dope. You know, she she played on, in Memphis, like NCAA. She is she was amazing. And she was like the first, I guess, hijabi uh, basketball player that was playing at that level in NCAA. Like we know how intense NCAA is just learning from it. Right. So the fact that she wanted to play overseas and she couldn't because of this rule I was in place. And um, I was following them. I was like, what? I felt resonate. I resonated with her story. I'm just like, that's insane. I didn't even think about wanting to play at that level because that wasn't my intention. But if I wanted to do it, that's in, that, that policy is in place. So I, I was just questioning all of that. And then interestingly, at that time, I was taking a sport policy course. Is Everything was just like that. Like, so I was just like fierce about everything because there were a few assignments that we had to write about, you know, like something regarding to policies. So I was just like, her, me following her story was just like, this is ridiculous. Why should an individual have to you know, choose between their faith and sport because isn't sport for all at the end of the day? Like, what is the purpose of sport? Is it to unite, you know, the country, the groups? It just isn't it to bring everyone together? So all of a sudden, this policy is saying that she couldn't participate at that level because of her Islamic identity. And then we go back to the whole stereotypical, you know, media, like how the religion has been portrayed for so many years. And now the sport organization, like a basketball organization, was telling Belkis she couldn't play. So I was just angry, literally. I'm just like, this is nonsense. And um, 2017, two years or three years later, they decided to lift the ban, but she couldn't play anymore because she's not just going to wait for three years sitting there waiting for the ban to lift so she could figure out whether she could play or not. So anyways, I, overall, I was just mad about the whole thing. I'm just like... I was happy that the ban was lifted, but why was that even in place in the first place, you know? So, yeah, so I would say, um, in a way, I knew I was an advocate. I was advocating for this group, but I feel like that was like an eye-opening experience for me because, and then seeing that change actually occurred, but like that should have, so if she didn't fight, what would happen to this generation of ballers that want to play at that level? Would they all be not be able to play? Um, yeah, in short, that's how I'll begin. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's yeah. uh that's a great response. I have so many things like going through my head right now, so I'm trying to remember everything, but <laughs> um, but yeah, it's true. And I mean it brings back to how you felt when you were younger and you just felt everyone was the same. You all had the same vision, you want to play basketball and learn, but then it's taken away. Like yeah. how how are you supposed to just sit back and be okay with that? And you're right ask the question, why was it in place in the, like, why? What is the, your justification for it? There is no solid justification for that. Um, and so, I mean, it's great that it was lifted, but two to three years later, yeah. and like you said, that affected someone's whole life and aspirations. Yeah. Um, and for what reason? What was the, like, why? Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, it's so true. And I mean, thank you for explaining your, your passion for basketball. I am Basketball is my life. I love basketball. I play basketball. I watch basketball. Everything about me is basketball. And so everything you've said, I relate to as well. And so it's true. I mean, I just, I love that you're still pushing for this change because things still need to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, it seems to be going well so far and mm -hmm. all we can do is keep pushing, right? Like these conversations need to keep being talked about and that's all we can do, right? So I mean, I yeah, loved so, all your responses. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, 
same as Brooklyn. I like thoughts going through my mind throughout everything you were saying. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so great to hear what kind of started and inspired um, to the person that you are today and everything that you've accomplished and that you're doing for others. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just really amazing. And yeah, it's just, it's crazy to look at these policies and to even think why why were they there in the first place like it doesn't make sense there was no rational reasoning like it is ridiculous and so um it's just great that you're taking that um that rage which is you know absolutely valid to be there um i'm angry i'm i'm upset like i think we all are and um turning that into change and positive change and um in turn just making opportunities for others so um that's really amazing. And yeah, thank you just for everything that you're saying. Like, um, it's just so great to have this conversation. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. And you're looking for ways to change, even if it's not your path. So it just shows how much you value every, everyone. Right. So that's amazing to hear too. Um, but we appreciate you so much coming on and talking about your story and your experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know we've asked you quite a few questions. Do you happen to have any questions for us? Mm -mm. Or are you? OK. Hey, um, I guess in terms of like after SPEMA, do you guys know what you want to do? I'm just curious. I like asking this question because <laughs> it's just like, I, I want to know because I feel like when you feel like you know what you want to do when you enter from high school, and like, oh my goodness, there's so many options. I don't even know what path to go through. So I'm curious to know what what path are you guys planning on going towards? Uh, Madeline, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I can tackle that. Um, that is a great question. Um, I've heard that question so many times, and honestly, every time I don't have an answer or my answer is changed, right? And mm -hmm. I like that you kind of touched that on. Um, you know, you go into SPEMA thinking this is what you want to do, and then your eyes are open to so many other things. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I originally kind of wanted to go into some sort of like event planning um, within like the sport industry. Um, I have a family member, we actually um, interviewed her um, earlier on, Justina Brooklyn, um, mm -hmm. and that's kind of something that she was doing. So she kind of inspired me. I thought it was so cool what she was doing. Um, but then I kind of saw that there's so much more out there. Um, specifically last last year, um, I had this one class and there were two lectures a week. So one lecture was dedicated to actual class material. And then the other lecture, um, because the instructor was a SPEMA graduate. So every week during that second lecture of the week, um, he would bring in one of his old classmates, um, whether that they could make it in person or as like a video call. And they would just talk about what they're doing, you know, three years after they graduated. And every single week was something so different. Mm -hmm. And it was like a job I'd never even heard of or never even thought of. Or there are all these different places in the world doing these like super cool things. So I know I kind of strayed off a little bit there. I don't have an exact answer, but I know there's so much out there. And I'm kind of just willing to try, you know, dip my toes in a little here, a little there and kind of see exactly, you know, what speaks to me. Um, I know either way I do want to make sure I'm incorporating or um, touching on, you know, diversity and inclusion in sport, because to me that's so important. Mm -hmm. um, so I know in whatever I do, that is something important to me. Um, so maybe policies, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Only yeah. second year. I know time's flying by so fast. Um, but we'll see. But yeah, thanks for asking that question. Very cool. Very cool. What about you, Glenn? Um, yeah, so for me, I was kind of opposite. I came into sport management not knowing what I wanted to do at mm -hmm. all. So okay. I knew it was basketball. All I know is basketball in my head. What I will do with that, I wasn't sure. But mm -hmm. so I actually was introduced to different positions that I never really thought of. I became interested in one in first year and was like, no, the next year. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's that's been my process. Um, I mean, for a while, I was did not want to be involved with events and now that's literally all I do so mm -hmm. that's still that's still there for me I love coaching um I do love the management side so I'm trying to find a position that I can still have the management side but also being in the chaos and involved with the team and the players because to me they're more than just a statistic and salary like I care about them on a different level and especially being an athlete 
that way. So I'm trying to find a job that I <laughs> could somehow do both. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what happens, but I'm still open to all opportunities. Like Natalie was saying, since I don't have a specific career and I think that's how I look at this female program too, is that I'm not stuck <laughs> in one position um, mm -hmm. and I can venture out and see, see all different types of positions and be eligible for them. So I think that's what I'm going to be doing is kind of, I don't know, we'll see. Trying to yep. find that my that idea, but also taking on all different types of opportunities. And also like Madeline was saying about diversity and inclusion, like Shima has my whole heart and is something I'm so passionate about. So I hope to continue that, whether I would still like to help out with Shima no matter where I am in life, but just continuing with that same vision and mission mm -hmm. um, for sure. So that will always be incorporated no matter what I do. So cool. kind of. My answer is really broad, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> oh, that's that's very exciting. Um, I think yeah, you just obviously I feel like right now you can. I don't know how much Madeline has been introduced to volunteering yet. Maybe you're. I think COVID hit you at the end of your first year, right? Yeah, and yeah, end of the yeah. first year. Oh man, that's tough. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> and then um, Brooklyn, like I feel like you have probably volunteering so many times already. And I actually believe in that. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. just that's how you learn too. Just how much, like literally, the industries. You know, like by volunteering is how you actually get to experience these roles and visualize yourself being in, you know, in those environments. So yeah, when yeah. COVID off, not virtual volunteering. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Yeah. But I think some people don't realize how important it is. Um, volunteering and networking that like you might hear it a thousand times but that's because you need to hear it a thousand times it's so true it's so important and both both ends volunteering and networking you never know who you'll meet you never know the opportunities that follow volunteering you can get firsthand practice in certain positions that you might be interested in pursuing um and then you don't know who you'll meet who know other people i've met people that are willing to vouch me give a reference bring my resume in and all those things so you just it's true there's kind of like a ripple effect you one thing will happen, the next thing will happen. And so it's true. I, I love that you mentioned volunteering and hopefully when everything is lifted, people can get involved again, for sure. Yeah. Cause I did get my first year full, filled with volunteer opportunities. So I was fortunate, yes. um, but I hope that everything will be lifted. So many students can partake in person <laughs> for sure. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you again for coming on and sharing your story. It was a lovely conversation to have with you. Um, we really appreciate it. And please let us know, let Shima know if we can help in any way. Um, we are right here supporting you. So yes, please let us know. Amazing.